Hallo, wir setzen uns. Schneller. Auch die zu spät kommenden, herzlich willkommen. Zweiter Tag der Hauptkonferenz. Wir starten relativ zügig mit dem, unserem ersten Keynote-Talk. Ähm, wir hatten ja im Programm schon angekündigt, wir haben zwei Keynotes dieses Jahr auf der Konferenz, passend zu den beiden Hauptthemen, bisschen was zur Webentwicklung, das kommt heute, morgen ein bisschen was zu eher im Bereich aus, dem, aus dem wissenschaftlichen Bereich, sage ich jetzt mal, das kommt dann morgen früh. Ja und ohne viel, ähm, achso, ein paar organisatorische Sachen, um das vorneweg zu sagen, werde ich im Anschluss hieran noch erzählen, wie das mit Abendveranstaltungen ist heute, nur mal so als Update. Ähm, aber wir starten jetzt relativ zügig mit dem ersten Keynote, Martijn Fassen aus Niederlanden, aus Holland. Ähm, ist da, erzählt uns was über seine neuen Entwicklungen im Bereich ähm, Webentwicklung. Und ähm, ja, ansonsten viel Spaß mit seinem Vortrag. Bitte. Thank you. So, uh, I have to give a content warning. Uh, keynote speeches are supposed to be content free. I originally submitted this talk not as a keynote, uh, 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 so I, I have to warn you, there might be some content left in this talk. Um, so first I'm going to give some, some keywords, some, uh, some themes to this, uh, to this talk. Um, spinning. Spinning is to uh, form by a slow process or by degrees and to extend to great length. Uh, and this to me is sort of a metaphor for uh, the creative process of creating software, which is what I'm interested in. Um, serendipity is uh, sometimes you just, things happen, you talk to people, you go to places, and then things fall into place that you didn't expect in advance that lead to new uh, creative developments. And uh, reimagining something, so to take something that you already know and you're very familiar with, and then stepping back and rethinking again Uh, like, what is this? What, what is it doing well? What is it doing not so well? Uh, and try to recreate it, perhaps, in a different way and learn something and get something new as a result. So, uh, what is this talk about, besides those uh, general, very broad themes? Um, the slow, serendipitous process of creativity. So, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more about how things happened, creative-wise, over time, uh, then perhaps the technical details to make this a little bit more of a keynote and have less content. Uh, creating new things by, uh, by, by reimagining existing things, maybe placing something in a different context, giving a different spin on it. Uh, I'll talk about a new Python web framework that I'm working on called MorePath. And I'll talk about Zope because I'm an old Zope guy and I wanted to scare you all. So, uh, me, I, I like to create new software. Uh, I like to be creative and uh, I do that in software. Uh, I created a bunch of things that you might, might have heard of or not heard of at all over the years. Uh, Formulator is a form tool uh, for Zope. Uh, LXML is a um, XML uh, um, framework or XML library for Python that's been taken over by Stefan Benel uh, about a year or so after I started and he It's much more competent uh, extending and maintaining it than I ever could be. Uh, five, which was some way to combine Zope 2 with Zope 3, if that says anything. Grok is a web framework built on top, top of Zope technology. Fanstatic is a static resource publisher, so it's like a web framework, but only for publishing your static resources like JavaScript and CSS. And Obvial is a client-side web framework. I'll talk a bit about some of these uh, a, a bit more later. Uh, and I'm interested not just in creating new things, but also in the process, creative process behind that creation. Uh, and I'm also happiest just as a person when I'm inspired and I'm creative. If I'm not creative, I'm just not very happy. I feel, uh, feel stressed. Um, so uh, some, some themes uh, surrounding creativity. Uh, if you want to be creative, you should never be entirely satisfied. I will give some examples where I was too satisfied and then I wasn't creative as a result. Uh, and where I wasn't satisfied and was creative as a result in this talk. Uh, talking to people is a good idea, just like I'm doing now. Uh, that is often uh, the rubber ducky effect, you know, you, even if you're just talking to somebody who's just listening, uh, might, might help you uh, clarify things in your own mind. But sometimes they give actual useful feedback, which is even better. Uh, Reimagining, 
uh, um, something that's already there, I already mentioned that. Uh, and it takes time, so the creative process often takes time. There's lots of little pieces that happen over the years that slow you, drive you forward in a direction you don't anticipate really, but, but in the end, you know, you can look back and say, oh, okay, there's these little steps along the way that led to this creation of this new thing now. Uh, so let's talk about ZOAP. Um, so uh, this is actually a metro station in Singapore and they built this kind of flying saucer there, which I think is a good metaphor for what ZOAP was in 1998. So ZOAP is this web thing. Uh, in, in 1998, uh, ZOAP was like this futuristic space alien from another dimension. It was just really strange compared to the state of the art of web development. Uh, it was not a content management system, it was not a web framework, we, we didn't really understand those very well at the time, so it couldn't even be uh, either. It was both and neither. Uh, it was enormously creative, it created a lot of new concepts of the way uh, you, know, you, you work with the web, you do web applications, you do development for the web. Uh, and, and one just major force of that creativity is the, uh, the lead architect of Zope, Jim Fulton, and he created uh, Zope. He also was uh, behind the Z2B, uh, or still is, is the uh, Zope object database. Um, he he uh, came up with this thing they called the component architecture. I will go into a little bit more detail about this later. He also created this tool build out to compose applications from Python libraries and, and other bits and pieces. Uh, and in Zope there are itself, there are a lot of sort of innovations, some of which turn out to be good, some of which not so good, but it's useful to look at. Um, and yeah, I'll talk a bit about Zope and me from 1998 to 2010. So I spent a lot of time first learning Zope, getting familiar with the concepts, using Zope to build new things on top of it, uh, trying to improve Zoop and, and even trying to redefine Zope to, to make it sort of relevant again in the changing sort of face of web development. Um, and yeah, along those lines, I did a lot of things. So Formulator is this form tool for Soap Silver, is a CMS uh, that sort of competes with Plone, but Plone totally, completely smashed and demolished it. Uh, five uh, is this uh, well, well, way to take uh, more newer Soap concepts that he had and put it back in the old framework so people could actually use them. Grok was a way to uh, was a, was an attempt to make Soap more um, um, sort of the advanced uh, uh, concepts of Soap more easy to use. Uh, I was involved in the Soap Foundation, and uh, yeah, I, I tried to help redefine something called the Soap Toolkit. And, and Soap was a very important part of my life. I'm a passionate software developer, and this this was part of my passion. Uh, and, and yeah, Zope was inspirational to me, it was an outlet for my creativity, so I was happy. Uh, but Zope was getting more and more frustrating. Uh, I kept trying to renew uh, 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 Zope so that I could be creative in it, but it was getting harder. And uh, yeah, some values I learned from Zope. So, so what do I like in a web framework has been influenced by Zope. Maybe my mind has been hopelessly warped, it's possible, but I don't mind. Um, and you're going to be hearing about it anyway. Um, so some some values. So one one value of, about, that I learned about from Zoop is that it's good to be to to write your web applications in a model-driven way. So you think about what your your model objects are, your model classes, and and then you build the user interface around that. Uh, and and you try to do it in a sort of declarative way, so that your models maybe declare a little bit of information about how what they are, what fields they have, or how they're put together, and then you can construct the application around that, you construct the user interface around that. Um, another thing that I'm going to talk about a lot more later is uh, something called URL path traversal. Uh, that's one value I learned, uh, I learned from Zoop. I'll mention it later. Uh, component configuration. Uh, this is a, um, uh, the concept that you actually have an explicit configuration phase when your application starts up instead of just having this sort of doing ad hoc configuration like, like some web frameworks do, like, okay, I need to, this needs to be configured, so we'll use a meta class here. Uh, this needs to be configured, so we'll use a config file there. And, and it's all a little bit grown over time, and it doesn't really happen in a very uh, um, well-defined manner. And I've, I've found, thanks to Zope, is that if you think about this in an explicit way, it might not have to be very explicit configuration, but you think about it as an explicit phase when your application starts up, that everything gets hooked, up, hooked to each other, uh, the, the bits of your application get assembled. 
then you can do more things with it. You can override, extend your application a lot better than if you do this in an ad hoc way where you have to start hacking if you want to override something or change the behavior of the application. If you make it explicit in your application's architecture, then it becomes possible to do things with it. It becomes a concept you can play with, an abstraction. Um, and a lot of that is done through clever registries. So I have an appreciation for clever registries that know a little bit more about the way Python classes uh, work than uh, normal registries. And I'll talk a lot, about, lot more about that later as well. So uh, in 2010, Zoop ended for me. This sort of was a difficult year for me in my professional life uh, sort of to go through that because it was a passion and I tried very hard. Uh, so I tried very hard to make it work. So I tried to redefine so make it relevant, try to get people energized, uh, try to clean up the platform so that it would be open for new creative developments again, try to revive the community in whatever sort of way I could. Uh, and, and I failed. Uh, I mean, I had some successes and maybe, you know, Zope was more relevant uh, 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 for longer than if I hadn't done anything, but in the end I failed and that was difficult. Uh, and I couldn't be creative and inspired anymore, and therefore I wouldn't. I wasn't happy. I was, uh, I was uh, stressed. And in September 2010, we had this Zope Summit. Uh, it was organized by uh, by Christian Toyner at Gosept in Halle, Germany. And uh, I'd asked for one actually when I was still, you know, hoping that we could somehow make so work. And then. When I had more or less given up, then there was the SOAP Summit. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, the SOAP Summit, there were people there, they were all very uh, you know, interested in, in getting SOAP working, but there was no real inspiration coming out from it. it, was, it was, there were talks about you know, how we can we improve our procedures, how can we do this, but there was no inspiration, and that's what I felt at least was, was lacking. Uh, there was no sort of, hey, let's all do this, this is fun, uh, this is interesting, oh, if we do this, then we can do that. That kind of energy was not there, and, and that's the energy I, I, I like in, uh, in a community like that. Uh, and uh, Jim Fulton was there, and I have a lot of respect for, for Jim, uh, you know, as a, as a person and as a creative uh, uh, a developer. And we had a stupid fight about nothing, you know, there, because I was frustrated and he was frustrated. And, you know, I, I still regret that. It's just uh, difficult. Uh, yeah, and I was cranky and gloomy, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, that was just because I was stressed, and I, I was still passionate, but, you know, there was no outlet for it. Um, Yeah, I mean, that was, it was difficult. It was a difficult thing. I mean, as a developer, we're not machines, right? We're people, so we should recognize that. So I, I thought I'd mention that. Um, so, there, of course, there's life after Zoop. Uh, so the same year, 2010, was actually full of glimmerings, full of seeds of what was to come in my creative life as well. And I'm going to talk about that now. Um, so... Um, a few things that happened in 2010. Early in 2010, Thomas Lotze was not here, and also a GoCept uh, guy. He, uh, he visited me to we work on something uh, for Go project for GoCept, uh, but only in the evenings we worked on something new, and I'm going to talk about that later. And uh, in September, actually traveling to the summit in the train to Halle, Germany, you know, it was a long trip, and I, luckily I was not alone. I had uh, my friend uh, Yeve there, uh, and traveling back again, we got to talk a lot, so, and talking about interesting things that did inspire us, uh, uh, which was a, it's a good thing. So the summit, even though itself was maybe not very inspiring, the things around it actually did help me a lot, uh, um, getting new things going. And when I was at GoCept uh, during the summit, I actually talked to Christian Zagotnik, who was not participating in the summit, about something I'd done at GoCept the year before, and that led to something else new as well. Um, and in November, I was at the Grok Sprint later that year in the Teutonburger Wald. Uh, it was a very nice location. Uh, and uh, yeah, some new things happened there as well. So all these things, yeah, they led somewhere, and that, that's cool. Is to see that that same year when you know there was just I felt bad actually was also uh, leading like every year to to the rest you know of your creative uh, life. Um, one of the things that happened during this. Uh, this trip uh, to and from the summit was uh, what we later named uh, Fanstatic. 
So this is this smart static resource publisher from Python that I mentioned earlier. So um, uh, what is Fanstatic? Well, I'll talk a little bit about the creative history uh, behind Fanstatic. So, so the idea was, and this was already emerged as a library called ZC Resource Library. Uh, it was written by people at Zope Corporation, not by me. Um, and they created this library that had this, this goal that if you are in your, if in the, your Python, you know, you have a, if you have a complicated web application and you have a lot of web pages and some of these web pages use particular widgets that need like some particular JavaScript library or a CSS library, like a date time code or something like that. You, you don't want to include them on your page just in case you're going to need it. Uh, all these, these JavaScript libraries, and you, don't want, you do want them to be there when you do need them, right? So this is sort of the, uh, the general problem. Uh, so ZC resource library, you could say uh, in your Python code, you know, when your web page was rendering somewhere in, your, in, in, in the code that was called by the rendering of the web page, uh, I want to have jQuery on my page now. And then the system would figure out, okay, jQuery, this, this library is, uh, is there, uh, we have it on this URL, and it would include uh, a little script tag on the web page, modifying the web page that was generated by the web framework, uh, and then just uh, load it. Uh, and this was very convenient, so you didn't have to you know, worry about in your, in your templates anymore how to load these things. You could forget about it in your templates. They wouldn't load any uh, JavaScript or CSS if you didn't want it uh, to be always be there. Uh, and you would just say in your Python code, I need this, I need this. And it would also know a little bit about dependencies. So you could uh, say, okay, jQuery UI needs jQuery. Uh, so if I load jQuery UI, then I should also always load jQuery because you know JavaScript doesn't have a dependency management system or has too many of them, depends on how you look at it. Uh, and, and this way we would solve this on the server side. Um, so CC resource library is nice, but it was a little bit sort of simplistic, a little bit hacky. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I thought I could do better. So I reimagined this, this ZC resource library as a little bit more um, well-architected library where you could say stuff like, like this. So in your Python code somewhere, well, first you could like import jQuery from some special uh, Python library somewhere. Uh, that would be an object, a Python object. And then you would say, uh, <laughs> you would say, uh, I need jQuery. Uh, and uh, then uh, it would include those, uh, um, uh, it, it would include the script tag automatically. And you could do that anywhere in your Python code that was called by, you know, by, by, by your web page. Um, and Hurry Resource had some new features. Uh, thanks to reimagining it, it, I could add a bunch of features. So it had things like support for minified versions, so you could globally configure. I want the minified versions of all my libraries, if they are available, uh, and not the full versions for debugging. So you could have different modes for deployment and for uh, development. And you could also say, OK, I want the combined versions. Maybe there's already a library that has both jQuery UI and jQuery, both in a single JavaScript file, and then it loads a little bit faster if you do that, instead of making multiple requests. So it, it could automatically uh, give you that information. It could also have things like um, <coughs> support for various optimizations, like inserting those script tags all at the bottom of your page instead of at the top, because that might be more efficient in some circumstances. So this was ZC Resource Library reimagined. And uh, <coughs> I was uh, pretty satisfied with this. We have a resource library, and I was sort of thinking, uh, what more could I need, right? It does what I need uh, needed to do, uh, um, and for quite a while I used it, and I didn't really see any need to improve it any further. It was quite stable. Um, and then in 2010, uh, sort of this thing happened. Um, so, so her resource was never responsible for serving the resources themselves. So the static files would still be served by something else, like the web framework, like Zoop or something like that. It didn't care about that. It just needed to know what the URL was, and then the web framework would do the rest. And um, we uh, sort of at, at the EuroPython 2010 sprint, I, I mean, I always tried to make her resource a library that was web framework independent, even though even we were only using it with Grok, a few people were. Uh, I tried to make it web framework independent, but I realized that it would be nice if it actually knew where those JavaScript resources were on the file system. You know, that was, seemed to make it more web framework independent if I did that. So I did a little bit of work on that, but I hadn't really seen yet what, what would be possible as a result of that. 
Um, and then, yeah, yeah, way in the train going to the Zulp summit suggested, or maybe on the way back, I don't know anymore. He suggested that we uh, uh, we create a whiskey component, uh, a middle piece of middleware that could actually also serve these resources. And then it suddenly her resource could do a lot more. Uh, and then at this forest sprint, you know, in the Titanburg of Wild Tree, we, 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 we worked on that, we created that. And uh, we renamed her a resource, which is not a very great, great name anyway. We called it Fanstatic, which is kind of cute. Uh, so that's her resource plus all the whiskey uh, stuff added. And uh, we, we actually made a URL for it. You know, better presentation of your open source project does matter if you want people to, to use it. Um, and uh, Fanstatic now suddenly, since it took care of everything, the only thing you as a developer need to do is like import jQuery in your Python code and say, I need it. And that's it. If you plug into your web framework, it will take care of everything else. It will serve those resources and, and it will uh, uh, do that well. And uh, um, suddenly, you know, this was suddenly her resource really gained a life after Zope. It became useful in, in Django or in, uh, in Pyramid. Um, and, and we, we realized we could add all kinds of new features. Now that we were serving these resources ourselves, we could actually say, okay, uh, we make sure that all the resources have very unique URLs, so that if the resource changes, the URL changes, so that we can cache it forever. So we can just send it to the browser once, and if there's a browser cache, the browser cache can retain it forever. We can just tell, it, tell the browser, don't, uh, uh, don't throw it away ever anymore. We could do that as a sort of performance feature. Uh, if you have like a caching server sitting somewhere that could also cache that information. So suddenly we could to take care of those things and try to do that well, uh, instead of leaving it up to the web framework, which was just not doing that very well. And we stole those ideas. So we reimagined Z3C hash resource, which was created by GoSept, uh, and, uh, and improved uh, on top of them. Um, and then from 2010 to uh, 2011 to this year, uh, people actually s did start to use Fanstatic. It actually worked. People, people are using it with other web frameworks now. And enough people are using it. Well, another guy actually is maintaining this more now than I am, which is always very nice. It's a sign of success of your open source project. If somebody else is you're doing all the real work and you're just sitting there collecting interest on it, you know, that, that is a very good thing, that you should always aim for that. Uh, take some giving up responsibility sometimes. It might be hard, but it's, it's, it's useful. Uh, uh, I see the Stefan smiling there, because that's what happened to Alex Amel. Uh, so Jan de Abdriese uh, 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 took the lead, and uh, he's, he's doing a good job on that. And we got lots of contributions by people. People would wrap all kinds of JavaScript libraries and make them available. So now, if I want to use some kind of JavaScript library, there's a good chance it's already out there. It's on PyPy, actually, uh, because we're misusing PyPy as a JavaScript uh, uh, package repository. And uh, <laughs> The, uh, and, and people, you know, found bugs, uh, contributed uh, features, uh, mostly small features, but last year, Wolfgang Schneer, another GoSap guy, he actually added a major new feature, is compilation support for uh, um, 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 uh, compiling, for instance, less templates or SAS templates or CoffeeScript uh, automatically as well, because that, that's our business, serving static resources like JavaScript and CSS as well. So that's sort of in our application domain. And we can really focus on that because we don't care about serving dynamic resources. Those are not for Fanstatic. Um, so let's yeah look at that creative process a little bit. How, how did that go? So first, I reimagined a library that was already there. Uh, and, I, and then I was too satisfied for a while. I thought I was done, you know. It's like I was not unhappy enough with what the state of the art. Uh, and actually talking to other people opened up this whole new era of creative, creative development, creativity. We suddenly were excited and we were thinking about all kinds of features we could add. Even though I really thought for like a year or a couple of years, like, this is done. Right? There's nothing more to be, uh, to, to be done here. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it took time. Uh, this process takes time. And, uh, you can see there's this process of years, sometimes nothing happens, sometimes a lot happens. Uh, the, these processes take time. So uh, I'll talk about another thing that happened that sort of had these uh, seeds in 2010. Ovil is in JavaScript, uh, and I know you guys are Python developers, but if you are also a web developer, developer then take JavaScript seriously. Right now, there is no way 
to, to, to do sort of advanced web development or, or, or even basic web development without taking JavaScript at least somewhat seriously. I know it's not like as nice as Python. It's only a badly broken Python, which is quite good for language, actually, I think. So, so just take it seriously. That's my educational message for this uh, uh, talk. So, um, so obvious, I will very briefly go to this because it's in JavaScript. Um, so that's a, it's a client-side web framework. Uh, so what I did basically is to look at concepts I already knew from server-side web development, and then like templates, and then bring them to the client side just to see what happens, right? So it's like, what happens if I can run my templates on the client side? How does that change the way I look at web development? I guess I'll statically serve my templates with static maybe, I don't know. Uh, and it just sort of, sort of reimagining the web framework, looking at it from a completely different perspective. And uh, that was quite a useful creative exercise. So uh, in 2003, actually, I, I tried re-implementing the Zope page template engine in JavaScript at a sprint sometime. And, and people would ask me, like, why would you want to do that, Martin? And I said, I don't know. I'm just doing it just for fun. I saw no, I saw no practical purpose in this whatsoever. Uh, I, I was just doing it because I could. Uh, so then I didn't think about that for years. Uh, and then in, in, in 2009, I, I did some work at Gocept, and uh, we were doing uh, uh, JavaScript development. And I thought, oh, JavaScript development, it's not right. I was not entirely satisfied. So I thought, i seen this. There is this JavaScript template library out there called uh, JSON template. So I thought, OK, let's use that and bring them to the client side. And it was actually quite neat. The code, I think, became uh, cleaner as a result of that. And the Gocept people built on top of it later as well. Um, and then in 2010, I, had, I was at the Zoop Summit and I talked to uh, Christian Zagrodnik and, and others uh, about it because I was about to start a big new client, uh, uh, web application for a customer and I wanted it to do it as a rich client-side application, uh, you know, with dynamic user interfaces and have the server just serve JSON. And uh, I was thinking about how can I best organize my code to do that. So I was talking about it to people just around that time uh, of the summit I was thinking about that. And then that led in 2011 to uh, the OVL core, which does sort of the basic model view stuff on the client side and the templates, and uh, a form library as well. And uh, then, of course, I noticed around the same time, like in 2010 when I started, I hadn't heard of any, you know, thing in JavaScript that was doing the same thing, but it turned out that, you know, this idea was right, uh, and the right it was at the right time. It was, uh, everybody was doing it suddenly. So then suddenly everybody was talking about Backbone and Ember and Angular. Everybody is doing that too, which in one way is disappointing because they're all using those systems and not Ovial. And the other way it's like, I, I some validation that at least the idea was uh, a reasonable one. And I also noticed a lot of parallel evolution. Like I recognize things that the Ember and the Angular guys are doing uh, with their systems. Uh, and I recognize the main obvious. It's like I understand how that is, uh, why that is so. And I also see differences, which are also interesting. Uh, and if nothing else, at least I've learned a lot more about how to organize such a system. So if I have to use Ember or Angular in the future at some point, then at least I will know uh, 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 quite a lot about what the reasons are, the way the things are, the way they are. Um, and yeah, in 2012, uh, even though OVL actually has only like three users in the world, some of those users were actually doing uh, like a big customer project for it, and they hired me to, to work on OVL, which was great. So I worked a little bit last year on, uh, on OVL template, and I put a whole INTN system on the client side, so it, uh, a way to mark up your template with translatable strings, and then use getx to get translated versions out, uh, which was... Um, uh, I don't think any other template language on the client side is doing something like that, but I knew from Zoop how that would work, so I reimagined it to the client side uh, and client side routing. Uh, and now I sort of moved on to maybe away from OBVL, but I've started to think about how to bind the server to the client and how to keep your models on the client in sync with the models on the server you might have. And I have some ideas and some code and all that there, and I need to wrap into it to a library and release it because I, I think it will be useful uh, uh, stuff. And I hope not everybody else is doing the same thing right now, they will, that they start about thinking about this stuff in two years' time so that maybe I'll get some attention this time. Uh, with my code. So, yeah, let's look at the OVL um, 
um, sort of review sort of what happened at OpVL. I was not satisfied with the state of the art in JavaScript development, and that led to the to, to, to new things. Uh, Reimagining the server side framework on the client side was enormously creative, it led to a lot of new ideas and and ways to do things. Uh, talking about it in 2010 was crucial in sort of solidifying those ideas, and it took time, uh, as these things do. So uh, let's go back to Zoop. Did I actually ever leave Zoop? Uh, in one way I did, but in the other way I kept taking those ideas that I had learned in Zoop and those concepts and applying them to different domains. So in, in another way there was a lot of continuity. But let's talk about server-side web frameworks again for a bit. So uh, Pyramid is this reimagined version of Zoop. So Chris McDonough, he got fed up with, with sort of the process of Zoop a bit faster than I did. And uh, he was right to do so. I was wrong to put more energy into it when it was not valuable anymore, I think. Uh, and he created this new thing, thing called Pyramid. Uh, and he, he basically stopped trying to fix Zoop. He reimagined Zoop in a better way instead, uh, which I think was a very good thing to do. Um, and I learned from, learned from what he did. And initially I was thinking, Chris, you know, you're forking the code, you're, you're, you're trying to do everything, you're rewriting everything. I was used to building on top of stuff that's already there. But I think he's right. I think it's better sometimes to say, think we are going to reimagine what's already there. We're going to make it better. Um, so one thing that I uh, 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 did, uh, started doing in 2010, was uh, uh, creating this... Um, um, uh, this new library, uh, which I now call Reg. And uh, Reg is the Zope component architecture reimagined, and that sounds very scary. Uh, but basically, Reg provides you with a few clever registries, things you can, like, like a dictionary, you know, you can register things in them and you can get things out of them again. That's what Reg is. And what Reg is for is to help you build very flexible pluggability systems for your Python project. Um, so if you have a Python project that needs that flexibility and that pluggability, then Reg is a component you could use to, to build it. And uh, yeah, you should, as I said, you should not be intimidated, even though it's sort of inspired by this Zope component architecture, uh, because it's just a few clever registries. Uh, and this is sort of the basics of Reg. Um, so the idea is you, you, you define a special kind of class, uh, sort of an abstract base class, uh, um, um, like I size, and then you register some things on it. You say, okay, if I want to get the size of a document class, then uh, I want to use the document size function to do so. And the document size function gets an instance of the document class and then gives back the size. It calculates the size somehow, whatever that is, in bytes or in text or whatever it might be that your definition is of size. Uh, and you might also do it for like a folder, which can, might contain documents. Uh, and for images and for files, you should have have this th th this uh, uh, this way to calculate the size. But you basically have different ways to calculate the size of uh, these different things, and you don't want to burden all those individual classes with that information. Uh, you're, you're, you, want to, you want to separate the concerns in this case. So the size calculation cannot be in the classes. Often, of course, it can be in the classes, and then you should just add a size method to those classes. But in some cases, you are trying to separate models from views or whatever, and, and you, you really do want to separate these, these concerns. And in that case, you can use something like generic functions. There's a pep all the way, I forget the number, uh, that, that provides these, but Reg can do a little bit more for you. Uh, and basically, you say, okay, I want the size of something, some content, I don't know what it is, it might be a file instance or an image instance or a folder or a document, uh, uh, give me the size. And that's how you would ask for it, and it would just look up the right thing. And if it happens to be an instance of a subclass of document or a subclass of folder, it would also find the size, so it knows about class hierarchies. That's sort of the cleverness of the registries, it knows about inheritance. Otherwise you could just use a dictionary. Um, so. Reg is based on the Zoop component architecture, which I had been using for a lot, and lots of people are using this, uh, and it was born more than 10 years ago, but we have learned since then, so it was, I, I started thinking it could be better. Uh, uh, the API of the Zoop component architecture is way too verbose, especially with what we've learned since then, there's just way too many different ways to do what amounts to the same thing in my mind, and the implementation is too complicated as well. Not easy to follow and to read and to adjust. Um, so in, in 2009, I had these ideas for doing a better API for the Zoop component architecture. Uh, and there was lots of discussion on the Zoop dev mailing list. Uh, 
uh, and then nothing happened, which is sort of part of my frustration. You know, if you try to propose something new, you get lots of discussion, but it's, it's mostly like stop energy. People have all kinds of subtly different ideas and nobody can agree on anything. Uh, in January 2010, Thomas Lotso was visiting me. That was one of those seeds of, of, of new developments. And we actually experimented with a better implementation. So that's the other side of the story. Uh, we, were, we started working on this library called iFace that had a better, just try to, to, to get the basic core algorithms uh, better defined. Uh, then in 2012, I was at this Croc Sprint in Nuremberg, and I, uh, uh, I, I worked on a better API on top of the old implementation of the component architecture. So I did the other side of the work, because I just had some time and I started playing with it. Uh, and then in late 2012, I hadn't thought about that for a while, so I, was, I did that and I let the code sort of rest for a while. I was at the Plone conference and, and then uh, there were lots of Zoop people there and they were talking about Zoop stuff and Zoop felt very much alive, like I hadn't seen it uh, for a couple of years. So that was kind of cool and energizing. And I figured I'd give a lightning talk about the stuff I'd done with Chrome, that better API. And actually, I did get positive responses then, the stuff that I didn't get on the Zope dev list. Like, hey, that's really cool. And people apparently were singing Chrome, Chrome, Chrome to beer in the evening I heard later. I don't know why, but I guess that was the beer. Uh, so uh, uh, that was uh, uh, interesting. So I thought I should combine that iFace thing that I did in the past. I mailed Thomas, I said, can I use that code uh, uh, you know, that we wrote together? And he said, sure. And I added the iFace code to the Chrome library, but I didn't quite hook them up yet, so I was, it was all half done. And then I didn't work on it for like half a year after that. But then in 2010, I, in, this year in July, I actually needed Clever Registries. I actually really needed them for an actual real project. Uh, it was not a theoretical exercise anymore, so I finally you know, got energized and I worked on hooking up the iFace implementation to the Chrome API. I refactored it a lot, extended it a lot, refactored some more, and then Reg was born. I figured I'd call it something else yet again, and this is actually published. Uh, you can read the documentation at uh, regredocs.org. Uh, so let's look at what happened here. So I was never entirely satisfied, well, maybe for a long time I was, but with the Zope component architecture, uh, I wasn't satisfied anymore. I wanted to fix it. Uh, I was talking to people. I talked to people who were working on the Chrome Black web framework. I'll mention that a little bit more later, I think. Uh, and I, I mentioned it to the Plone people during my lightning talk. And then, you know, reimagining the component architecture uh, and took, definitely took time. There were like periods of no development and then suddenly things sped up again and you know, that took, took a few years. Uh, so why did I need these clever registries? Because I was actually working on a web framework and since I'm using like Zope values, I want clever registries, I want to be, uh, uh, have this uh, awareness of, um, uh, of inheritance in the system, I want to have registered components, so I, I want to be model driven, so I needed the clever registry. So I was working on this thing that I call Morepath, and Morepath is not Zope, but it is inspired by Zope. Uh, it's actually, I noticed very recently when reviewing Flask, it's in some ways uh, some parallel evolution with the way Flask works, the micro framework. Uh, well, a Zope-like web framework that Zope reimagined, why would you not use Pyramid? Uh, Pyramid is exactly a Zope reimagined. Uh, uh, and Pyramid is great, and I recommend it to everybody who should use it. Uh, uh, but of course, I don't need an excuse to create something new anyway. I like doing it, so why not, right? Uh, I should just create something new. Uh, and it will be different anyway. It will be my reflection on what I learned over all these years about how to do web development. And uh, I'll give you excuses anyway, because uh, I want to give them, and I know you want them too. So I want to support RESTful, which client applications. So I've been developing not stuff on the server side so much anymore, but on the client side. And I want my web framework to be supportive of, of rich client applications, applications written in JavaScript that get JSON uh, out of the uh, server from URLs, and the JSON should contain URLs pointing to other, other bits on the server and you know, have a RESTful interaction with the, uh, with the server using JSON. Uh, and, and nobody's doing the right thing with paths in the web frameworks. That sort of bugs me. Uh, and paths are very important, I think, especially for rich client-side applications. Uh, we need to think more about paths. Uh, so more path is a Python web micro framework with superpowers. Uh, it's small, but it has the power of reg, so it can do all kinds of sort of uh, uh, fancy things. 
uh, it has these OAP values without these OAP fear factor, like, oh no, it's OAP, I run away. Uh, uh, and uh, more path configuration is explicit. It's not some kind of import time side effect, like I import my application code and all kinds of magic configuration happens during import time. If something goes wrong, there are import cycles, whatever, things get crazy. Uh, this happens in a separate phase, so more path can actually reason about it, and that, that's, that's useful. Uh, it uses a library called Venusian to do that, and that's actually a reimagined version of Martian, which is a library we wrote for Grok. And then Chris McDonough came and he reimagined it into Venusian. I thought, oh no, he's rewritten Martian too. Why? Well, he was using Martian before. Then he was not satisfied with it. He wrote it, wrote it to Venusian. I was annoyed, but now I'm using Venusian, so I'm not annoyed anymore. I think that was a good thing. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, it uses the request response implementation of Werkzeug. Uh, I thought that Germans might be happy with that. It's not using WebOp, which is this American thing. Uh, I'm using Werkzeug. Uh, it helps that I can pronounce Werkzeug a little bit better than uh, the average American, perhaps. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so MoPath is not revolutionary. I don't try to rethink the whole way web frameworks work, but it does try to do things a little bit differently. It does put a different spin on things. And it does paths right. Uh, so so this, this is a map of bicycle paths in the town I live, Tilburg. Uh, there's lots of paths uh, uh, out there. Uh, these are the sort of the scenic bicycle routes. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, about paths. So uh, here's a URL, and the last bit there in green is a path. Uh, this bit. And, and it starts maybe with an application, you know, the, the, the blog application is, sit, is sitting on this path. And then in this blog, there's a collection of articles. So sort of th that's what the second step, the slash article step is about. And then uh, I want article number 17. So number 17 indicates a model, uh, an article model, instance of an article class somewhere perhaps. And then uh, the edit bit, I want to edit article number 17 in my blog. Uh, is the uh, is the view, so that's the way I think about about paths. And these are also paths. So here you have like there's no slash edit in the end, uh, uh, and that's maybe the default view for for my article number 17. Um, this is the collection of articles. Maybe this shows me a list of articles that are in my blog. Uh, or maybe this does. It's the, uh, this is the blog application. And this is just the root of the website. And for in simplicity, in the continuing discussion, I will ignore this app kind of uh, step of the path, which is not always there, called blog. Uh, I will just talk about slash article 17 and slash article 17 edit. Uh, so how does Django do that? How, I mean, some people might have heard of Django. It's this web framework that some people use. And, uh, it's uh, how does Django sort of work getting that path, uh, um, getting something to happen when you go to slash article slash edit, uh, slash article slash 17 slash edit. So, well, there's, there's basically a function that takes care of the response. In this case, the response is very simple. I show article colon and then the article title. Uh, that's sort of what's happening in my, uh, in my response generator. Uh, so. I somehow query for the article using the ID of the, uh, of the article, uh, so 17, and then I get some article instance back, and then I say show its title. That's sort of what happens to, to display it. Of course, in a real world application, it will be a lot more complicated. There will be a template and all kinds of stuff, but it's sort of the basics of what might happen. Uh, and then you need to register that uh, edit article function uh, uh, under a name, which I've named it also edit article here, uh, in a sort of patterns registry that Django has. And then I have to say with a regular expression, it's like, yeah, if you want more problems, you should use a regular expression. Uh, uh, you, have to, you have to express sort of what your path looks like. And I always get confused, but basically it says article and then some, some number, some integer number, and then slash edit. Uh, and if, it, if your URL matches that, then it will call edit article, and then uh, it will do its work. So that's what Django does with paths. Uh, and there's the opposite operation as well, which is often forgotten, is to generate a path. So if I already have my article, how do I actually get a path to it? Right? Or to, how do you get a path to my edit article view? 
Uh, so uh, Django has two ways. One is in the templates, uh, in, the, in the Django templates, you can say, I want to use that view name, that edit article view name that I registered here, like name equals edit article. And then I, uh, uh, I want to put in the parameter 17, and this will generate slash article slash 17 slash edit. Uh, for you. And this is the equivalent in Python code. So you give it the argument 17 and then uh, say, I want to use this edit article uh, uh, route uh, and put 17 in it and give me the URL. So that's how the inverse operation works. So let's look at Pyramid, see how Pyramid is this. Pyramid also has a traversal implementation, but I'm talking about its routing implementation now. Uh, I'll mention traversing later. So this is. Uh, uh, how it gets the uh, article. It's very similar to the Django bit, the function on top. Uh, there's a bit of difference how you get the ID out. You have to get it from the match dict on the request, and then you generate the, uh, the title again. Uh, and then this is how you register it. So it's very similar to Django, but there's no regular expression. It has its own little language there. You say the edit article uh, um, um, route ha it has this path. And this is how you, uh, th that's the view function you use to, to, to render it when you go to that path. Uh, and this is the inverse operation for Pyramid. So there's route URL, and yeah, you have to give its route name, you have to give it the request, and you have to give it uh, Django hides the request away, which I think is, uh, Pyramid is doing it better. Uh, I think that should be explicit. And then it gets the, uh, the ID there, and then it constructs the, uh, the path. Uh, and this is how Flask does it, again, very similar, yet a little different language there for defining the path. Uh, and then uh, you, uh, uh, but it, it's all in one step because it uses a decorator there. Uh, more path does something similar, actually. So it says at app route, and then it sort of registered it in the application, uh, registered this path so it can recognize it. Otherwise, very similar. Uh, and generating a path for Flask hides away the request, but it's, uh, it's there in the background. Uh, uh, and uh, it, you say, okay, I want to use the editor article route, and I want to put in that 17 again. Uh, so path in routing systems, they all sort of work the same way. Uh, they, uh, you, um, uh, you match this route. Uh, you get this ID out here, which is the bit that uh, that's a variable that matches, and then you put it into some uh, some function that gets that ID or gets whatever is matched, and uh, looks up some model, uh, and then generates web content for that model, HTML or JSON or whatever. Uh, but Zope actually is different. Zope has this system where. Uh, um, um, sort of back in 1998, uh, the Zope was quite innovative, uh, it, was, uh, um, it was doing something called traversal. In 1998, basically the state of the art was that a path would go to a file, not to a function, but to a file. And then the file would be an HTML file perhaps, or it would be a Perl script or something, a CGI file, and then it would be executed. That was the way web development was done back then. And so Pioneer it was one of the first systems that actually let you hook up code to a path. So a function would get called when you were in the end of the path. And everybody's doing that now, but traversal is, is different than what everybody is doing. With, with, uh, with traversal, there is no route function, there is no route, uh, there's just objects and methods. So the basics of traversal is, if I want to go to article no number 17, my, my article slash article slash uh, 17 slash edit is translated to looking up the article key in the, uh, in the root object, and then looking up uh, 17 in the article object that I found, and then looking up the edit uh, 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 function in the, uh, in, in the, artic in the uh, article 17 uh, uh, object that I found, and then calling it with a request. Or perhaps it looks like this. If it doesn't does get adder instead of get item, it will look like that. So that's more or less what the underlying system will be doing. It will an event call the edit method on the article object. And there is no route ID concepts. There, is no, uh, there are no routing parameters. There are just models. And the way you can generate a link is just say giving uh, to something is to say, I want, if model happens to be an instance of article, I say, I want a link to this article. I want a link to the edit view of the article. Then I say something like that. Uh, I want to make a link. Uh, the request is useful information about the rest of the URL, so you need to pass that in somehow. Uh, I want to make a link to the article, to the edit view, or to the default view, or whatever it might be. That's how you generate a link. The syntax of that is different in various zopes, uh, but the, uh, 
um, uh, the sort of the principle is the same. You can just generate a link to a model or to a view on a model. And a nice property of this is if you rearrange your URL structure, then the views all follow along. If you putting your your article in a completely different place, it's not under uh, slash blog slash article, but it's somewhere else. Uh, then the view will still be there. The edit view will be still be there because it's just a method on the article object. So of course it will be there. Uh, so you can rearrange things. Things will still work, and the URLs will also still work. All the URLs you generate with this will they will just continue to work. There is no uh, uh, there is no breakage of links if you use that consistently. Um, but there are some drawbacks. In this original traversal implementation, there was no model view separation. The view code needed to be on the model, and I like the edit method, and that sucks. So the, the, that's not really nice. And the uh, object structure uh, needs to reflect the web path. So you need to make sure that you have a root object with article with an article container in there, and in there there need to be the individual articles. Your object structure basically has to follow along to your web paths. And and in some cases, like if you use a Zoop object database, you just store Python objects, that's not really a problem. That fits quite well. But if you have a relational database and you use an object relational mapper, that often doesn't really match very well. You want to use a query, for instance, to get your object and not to have some kind of tree structure. Uh, you can work around some of these issues by making a hierarchy of virtual model objects that are just basically Python objects that then refer to the real ORAM objects, but that's all a little bit messy. It's, uh, you have to make a separate hierarchy again. Uh, so in SOAP 3, we tried to reimagine the traversal story and make it better, and then we started using a clever registry, because SOAP 3 was all about using clever registry, to look up how to traverse an instance of a particular class. So instead of the class needing to have this get item on it, uh, uh, how to traverse it, we would separate that information from the class and uh, add that information separately. We would look that up in a registry. So how to uh, traverse through the article collection. How do we do that? Well, we look it up in the registry. We look up for a function or, a, or an instance or something that knows how to do that traversal. Um, and uh, that means it's less dependent on the structure. You, your models need to be less so in a tree structure. Uh, and it allows model view controller. The last step is also looked up in a clever registry, the edit view. Uh, and uh, that allows you to separate the view code from the model code. But since we use the clever registries, the edit is still associated to the class that you hook it up to. It's not a method anymore, but it's as associated uh, to that class as if it were a method. So if you move your class to another place, the edit view just follows around. And this all still works. So you can still link to models in the same way. Uh, and this is model driven. You can declare models and you can expose these models using these views and it allows you to say, okay, if I have like some, some, some model that derives from a base class, uh, if I provide some standard views for that base class, then the subclass will automatically uh, also have all the subclasses that somebody might implement will also automatically have those views, which is very useful if you want to do like a model driven uh, uh, framework. Uh, so the admin UI of Django, for instance, could follow from subclassing the right base classes, and you just register all the views on for the admin UI on the base classes, and if you inherit from them, then they will be there, uh, and you don't need to uh, do anything special. Um, and this supports more declarative application, which is better application design, and it allows better reuse of both the models and, and the views. But there are still problems with traversal. So I ran into these problems when I was trying to do SQL Alchemy object relational mapper with, with SOAP3, with Grok, and I ran into this impotence mismatch between the ORM and traversal. Like basically the core of the problem is if you have like something that's mapped to the ORM, uh, then you say basically that articles here is just a Python list. If you do it the normal way, you would do it with SQL Alchemy. And, uh, that is, uh, but what you want with traversal is that you want to put in the article ID number 17 in there, but a Python list is not ordered, you know, like the database would be. So you want to do a query for number 17. You don't want to just get index number 17 of that list. That doesn't really work. So that doesn't really match very well. Uh, and, and, and yeah, if you if you do something with the normal SQL Alchemy style of mapping your objects, then it becomes hard to build traversal on top of it, even if you have these with these clever registries. Um, 
and you don't want to actually make your ORAM, you can, what you can do with Seco Alchemy, Seco Alchemy is very powerful, you can adjust your whole ORAM mapping and say, okay, instead of articles being a list, I will make articles being a dictionary, and then I can use my article key, you know, this number 17 as the index, and everything will work. But then I have to adjust my database model that I might be using in non-web applications to fit the web, and that's not right. Uh, I want my database models to just be normal Python objects that are right as Python objects, and then the web should be layered on top of that. It shouldn't be that the, my database model has to adjust to the web. And traversal still really sort of pushed me in that direction. Uh, so I wasn't satisfied with, with, with Migorg RDB. And, and routing doesn't have this mismatch. With routing, you, you can do any query to get the model for any route. So there is no problem there. Uh, this problem goes away with routing. That's the cool thing about routing. You just query, do whatever a SQL query or whatever database you have, you get it back, you get your model, and you don't have to adjust any hierarchy or any of these models to, 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 to fit the web. Your models can just be just Python objects. Uh, but I do want this. I want to be able to link to my model instance. I don't want to have to uh, remember route IDs and stuff like that. I want to be able to link to models, not to views. Uh, so could I combine routing with traversal and then get the best of both worlds, get the, the linking that I want, but also get not this, this, this mix-up that I have to make the, uh, everything fit traversal. Uh, uh, so maybe Pyramid solves this problem, uh, because Pyramid also supports traversal. Uh, uh, Pyramid has this sort of traversal that's very similar to the original Zope traversal. It's actually a little bit less advanced in some ways than the Zope 3 traversal was, but it's simpler and easier to use. So you just put a get item on your object and then uh, to, to get it sub the, the, the next step of the path. Uh, but with but then the innovation of Zope 3 that this lookup step happens in the end. So slash edit, the last bit that gets looked up as a view using in Pyramid. Uh, but Pyramid, this doesn't really fix my problems. This has the same problems that I already described. Uh, but Pyramid has routing and has traversal. Maybe it combines routing and traversal. So I looked at the Pyramid documentation and I saw this like a warning sign and it said, you can combine them, but if you do, you have to understand a lot of things and it's quite complicated. So we recommend you don't do it unless you really have to, uh, which is not really what I want. I want this to be the easy case, not the hard case. Uh, so in 2009, I wrote this library called Traject. Uh, which was sort of supposed to be web framework independent, and it's routing a model uh, to a model and not to a view. That's the big difference. So when you ha it is a routing library, but it routes to a model and not a view. And then for the last step, slash edit, or maybe the default view, it looks up the view by name. Uh, and this allows, this is my favorite way of linking things in web applications. And I've been using that for years now with Grok. And, and I ran into a case where this was really powerful. So I used this for an application. I started in 2010. And then this year, I think it was earlier this year, I ran into this problem. There was this, I had this rich client application. There were lots of URLs, there were lots of JSON. And I was using it, it was in production. And then suddenly a new feature request happens, as these, these things do, right? So a new feature request by, by the customer uh, and I figured that actually the only way to solve that new feature request was that I needed extra information in lots of the URLs of my application. Uh, the URLs were insufficient to support that feature request. I really had to just lots of URLs everywhere. So I, I struggled, I tried to get around that, and then I actually realized, no, I should just change the URLs of my application. It's actually easy. So I changed one Python file, and then everything still worked. My client side application worked, the rest of my application worked, everything just still worked. I didn't have just anything else. And the new feature was implemented. And lots of URLs had changed. There was an extra step in lots of URLs that my client side application was requesting from the server. <coughs> My client-side application still wor worked because it was getting all its URLs that it ever would need uh, from the server. It wouldn't try to construct URLs uh, uh, itself. I strongly recommend against doing that. Like, it's very tempting in your JavaScript application to construct the URL there. Don't do that. Do it. Construct the URLs on the server, send them to the client as part of JSON, and, and use them that way. Because when you do that, you can make this adjustment and have everything still work. If you don't, you have to adjust a lot more code. Um, but you might say, I can do that with Django, Pyramid, or Flask. Uh, I mean, th th that you do have this inverse operation. I just showed it to you, right? You can generate a URL, uh, put the 17 in. <coughs> well, my first question is how many people actually cheat and hard code URLs anyway? Because it doesn't really add that much to, the, to just hard coding URLs. So maybe people uh, cheat. 
<coughs> many of you might say, uh, can I have some water, please? I'm getting it. Um, so uh, you say, no, no, I, I, I won't cheat, Martijn, uh, so I win this argument. I can do this fine with, with Pyramid or with Flask. Uh, I can just do this everywhere, you know, or the equivalent in your particular web framework. Um, I can do this. I can just uh, name my route and then put in the article ID there. And then, you know, if I do that everywhere, then uh, everything will be right if I use Flask or I use Pyramid or I use Django. Um, but if you don't cheat, you still have to remember all these route names with the request. I mean, there's this edit in there, but that's just the edit view on article. Uh, it's not. You don't have to remember these route names everywhere if you do it. Uh, and with this scenario, you still have to remember these route names. Whenever you generate a URL, you have to know what route it was and look it up somewhere, perhaps, uh, which is a little bit annoying. Um, but not that annoying. Uh, it's OK. You can look up the route names. Uh, but you also have to look up the parameters. You actually have to know that there's an ID that goes into that route. You have to remember that bit as well everywhere, which is annoying. Uh, and then you have to remember how to get the ID from the article. So I'm creating a link to the edit view of the article, and I have to remember that I have to do dot .id of the article there. And I have to do that everywhere where I generate a link to articles. Um, and if you compare that to request link and then just an article instance, and then maybe the edit view or the default view or whatever view it might be, then this is quite a lot more cumbersome. This doesn't break. You don't need to remember as much here. Uh, and, and with standard routing, you still need to repeat yourself a lot when you create URLs. You have to repeat yourself. Uh, you have to keep getting the ID of the article. Each time you generate a link to an article in your application, you have to do article.id. Uh, and each time you have to remember the route name. You have to repeat yourself a lot more than with this case. And I don't like to repeat myself. Uh, the computer can do that for me. Uh, so Trajack, this library, is web framework independent, like Fanstatic, right? So everybody could just start using it. And I talked about Fanstatic at EuroPython some years ago. And I talked about a concept at a Django con uh, 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 conference. Uh, and, but nobody uses Trajack but me, right? I'm the only user. Uh, so this is not like Fanstatic. It's more like hurry.resource, where you know, I'm the only user. Uh, something is wrong there. Um, Trajack as a library won't work. People won't take the time to examine it and in in integrate it into their own web framework. It's just too much. Uh, I don't think that's, that, that's right. Um, and it's time to rethink Trajack anyway, because I have some new ideas. I can make it a little bit better. So uh, in 2010, I, uh, I started working sort of a little bit on a way to take a URL and finding a model and then a view, sort of inspired by Trajack at this sprint. <coughs> and then I forget about it again. I create this library called Downlight, and I don't think about it anymore for, um, uh, for quite a while. And then I, two years later, I'm at this, uh, or one and a half years later, I'm at this sprint in Nuremberg. And at this sprint, hey, wait a moment. Did you guys notice? Yeah, yeah, I noticed too. Uh, the, the uh, what? You're talking about, no, no, this, it's not, I'm not talking about the umlaut that's missing in Nuremberg, guys. That's not what I, uh, uh, what I noticed. I, I noticed that I get all this inspiration in Germany. I'm all at these German summits and sprints and whatever, and, and I'm getting this inspiration, and I work on all this new stuff. So I think it's something you put in the water or something here. Um, so uh, yeah, for that, I'll, I'll add an umlaut to, to Nuremberg. Thanks, Germany. Uh, I won't do the rest of the presentation in German. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, at the Nuremberg Spring, we concluded that Grok, the web framework I was working on previously, is now in maintenance mode. We're not going to change it much anymore. And that closure freed up my mind to think about new web frameworks. And the Chrome Lag developers, which is another web framework, uh, inspired me. Unfortunately, those are French. They're not Germans. Uh, so Chrome Black is this reimagined Grok. It's another web framework nobody ever heard of. And they actually turned out to be using my Dawnlight library. I hadn't thought about it anymore, but they're actually using it. With reversals, they don't solve the problems I just talked about, but they actually are using it. I thought, hey, maybe it's actually useful. So I put a version of Dawnlight heavily refactored in Morpath now. And I hack on this Chrome library that later becomes the Eric library. And then <coughs> this year, I was hired by a um, German company again uh, called Contact, and they hired me to help rethink their web framework, um, client side and server side. They have this web framework now, 
<laughs> they want to improve it, and they you know, hired me to help think about that and work on it. And I anticipate if you have a rich client side applications, which they want, you are going to have lots of JSON uh, with lots of URLs to ORAM mapped objects, which have an ORAM everywhere. Right, so they have they have this kind of more path style problem, and something like Traject would be nice. So I started to create a web framework that does the right thing with paths. This is what drove me into actually really putting all these pieces together. Uh, bonus keyword, you know, I already spent years exploring things, writing little bits pieces of code, um, um, doing stuff that I never knew would come to anything really. Uh, but because I did, when I actually needed them, there was a lot of thinking and a lot of code already there that I could use. So exploring is really valuable. Uh, and so bonus keyword. Um, so more path um, is this, uh, the, the, this micro framework that, that does routing a little bit different. And uh, the idea is you route to a model, and then you look up a resource or a view uh, that represents that model. And it's all based on the path. So what does that code look like? So let's compare that uh, to the other ones. Uh, so what you have here is you have a, uh, a route to a model. So you say article slash ID. You say this is routing to the model article. And you also say the inverse operation. You say if I want to get the ID from the article, this is how I do it. I do article.id. You define it in one place, not everywhere where you want to generate the URL. You just define it here. And then the get article is just the same as the other uh, um, the rest of the code, except it's separate, right? So get article doesn't care about presentation. It just cares about getting the article from the database somehow, doing a query. And then uh, you have a separate registration. You say, I register a edit view for my article. Um, so that's what you do with the second decorator. And then that second decorator is only concerned with presenting that article, not with getting the article from a database. It's only concerned with presenting the title. So those two operations are separate from each other. That's the difference between traditional routing and more path routing. Uh, and then generating the path is actually really this. This is what I want, and this is what you can do with more path. You get some article from a database somewhere, or somebody has created an article somehow, uh, as long as it's the article class, Morpath will know how to generate a URL for it, and it will just create it and add edit in the end, that, that edit argument, just a slash edit, that's all it does. Um, and you could say, well, this is slightly more verbose, right? I, my, my route definition is slightly more verbose. I need to register with, with two decorators instead of one. But you'll be repeating yourself a lot less in URL generation. I think that really sort of more than pays for the uh, trouble of doing this separate uh, separation. And you know, separating those concerns is a good thing anyway. In general, I think it makes it easier to test, uh, and you get more expressive power uh, because you. It works for articles, but it also works for subclasses of articles. That, that, you get this for free. So this registration here uh, does it for article. But if I make a subclass of article, it will also, they will also be available on those URLs. And they will also have the edit view. Um, so uh, what if you have no model? Maybe you have no database model. Uh, like a collection model that is not in a database, you just make it up. You make a Python class that is a model, and you, you do it, do that. And by having an explicit model class, you can do things with that. Uh, you can do declarative, more declarative development. You can do, um, uh, you can you can add views to it as well. You you th th this helps to make that explicit. Um, there are there are ways to have like views to the default like URL without the slash edit. Um, there's also ways to define views. I took that idea from Pyramid to define views for, um, um, uh, like, I only want this view to happen when a GET request happens. When a POST request happens, I want to use this other view, the other resource code. You can separate those uh, those from each other. Uh, subclassing works, as I mentioned. So if you uh, <coughs> expose a uh, swallow class to a URL, then African swallow instances will also automatically be, be exposed to those URLs. Uh, those advanced features uh, that I need to document, you can actually base paths of other models, not just off the root. Uh, that makes it easier to make like a, a model that has a whole set of paths hanging on to, on, onto it, and you can reuse that as a whole. Um, it has support because of that explicit configuration has the support for application composition. You can make an application, combine it with another application, and all the URL paths will be combined with each other. Or you can separate them from each other, whatever you want. You can build applications, sort of a, you can nest applications as well. Uh, 
and uh, here's the implementation status. So it's, it's alpha software. Uh, some features are still planned. I mean, who needs server-side templates, right? Who's using them these days? I, I just use JSON everywhere. Well, maybe you need it. So I do plan to add server-side template support at some point. It needs documentation. And uh, it, the code is small, so it's a micro framework, so I expect I'll move quickly on implementing some of these features. And I'd like to have feedback and contributions if people have them. And uh, let's look at how uh, the creative process went here. I was never entirely satisfied. I want my models and my routing too. I want my cake and, and eat it. Uh, I reimagined the way routing worked, and, and then I reimagined it again. Uh, and it takes time. And talking to people, I start doing that for more path now. Uh, well, I've done it a little bit already, uh, but I start for real today. So that's what I'm doing, and I hope new creativity flows from that. So uh, yeah, I invite everybody to look at it. Uh, the source code are tests. I will. Uh, I promise I will add some documentation very soon. Uh, the regit documentation is there, uh, and uh, please use the power and uh, try it out and see whether it. Uh, works for you. And even if, you know, more path, nobody uses more path, at least I have the concept of routing to a model out here now, I have a demonstration case, so maybe Pyramid will adopt it. That will be fine as well, and at least I have that feature in Pyramid. Thank you.